Okay, thanks a lot for everybody who is present in, the, in this very big room. Uh, thanks also for the remote audience. It is quite clear that you have, and you have the floor too during the question and answer, and we hope that you will intervene. So perhaps just to start, uh, as you know, UNESCO has taken a certain number of initiatives, and we must underline the importance of this initiative as regards AI ethics regulation. Now you know that they have published it in November 2022 a recommendation on AI ethics, and definitely more recently, perhaps you, you have seen that, they have published a report about the application of the recommendation to chat GPT. And that's why it is an honor for us to host uh, Gabriela Ramos. Gabriela uh, Ramos is definitely very well known. Uh, she is uh, the director of the SIH UNESCO department which is in charge of the AI ethics recommendation implementation. So uh, Gabriel Ramos was unable uh, to join us because the, the time difference between Paris and uh, Kyoto, uh, but she has sent yesterday a video in order to be present with us. So perhaps, you might launch the video. UNESCO, the compass for our work on artificial intelligence is the recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence that was adopted by 193 countries back in 2021. The recommendation determines that uh, artificial intelligence technologies need to be well aligned with human rights, human dignity, fairness, inclusiveness, and these values that are the ones that we uh, put together for the, for the technologies translate then into principles, principles of accountability, transparency, the rule of law, proportionality. But we do not stop there because all this framework then is translated into very concrete policy recommendations. We have 11 policy chapters that go into the gender issues, data issues, um, environmental issues and many more. And those policy areas instruct member states, for example, I'm going to give you an example, to develop data governance strategies that ensure the continual evaluation and of the quality and the training of data, promote open data and data trust, and call members to invest in the creation on gold standards data sets and ensure that when there is harm, compensation is given related to this information. And the recent uh, release of foundational models, AI models, have been meteoric, with ChatGPT gained 100 million users within the first month of operation. And we have seen a, a huge amount of excitement around the capabilities of this generative AI. It's impressive what they can do and, and what they can offer in terms of the service to the world. But these models have also foregrounded major concerns about potential negative ethical, social, political, and legal implications, and highlighted the urgent need for robust and effective governance systems and regulation. We have conducted our own analysis of generative AI models through the lens of the recommendation and found that a range of ethical concerns related to fairness and non-discrimination, reliability, misinformation, privacy, data protection, uh, the labor market, and many, many more with this accelerated pace of issues that we already have identified before. The systems replicate, but also massively scale up many of the same ethical and governance challenges of previous generations of AI systems. For example, we have known about the potential of gender and racial biases in AI systems for many years now. And we see that the same kind of stereotypes being massively reproduced in the latest systems. For example, narratives generated by GP3 were shown to reinforce gender stereotypes, depicting female characters as less powerful and defining them by their physical appearance and family roles. 
And just last week, a researcher at Oxford John Hopkins found that it was impossible for Mid Journey, a commonly used AI image generation tool, to produce a picture of black doctor treating white children. Whatever variation of the prompt used, the system will only produce a picture of a white doctor treating black children. But there are also new and pressing challenges, for example, around issues of authorship and intellectual property rights. As the platform do, does not quote these sources and lack transparency on how it works. Legal actions are currently underway to determine, for example, whether OpenAI breached copyrights by training its model on novels without the permission of the authors. And on the other hand, to decide whether an output of a generative AI model can itself be copyrighted. This is another area where the incredible concentration of economic and now cultural power in the hands of a small group of companies and the small, of course, group of countries uh, need to be addressed uh, in, a, in, a, in a determined uh, manner to make it more inclusive and more um, representative of the very diverse uh, world in which we live. And then the, the, the way in which these current experimental AI tools have been unleashed in the public provides a primary example of why it is imperative for member states to implement the recommendation of UNESCO to ensure that actors identify, clarify, and mitigate some of the risks of harm from such models before rushing them to deploy them in the, in the markets. And to address this challenge, UNESCO has developed an ethical impact assessment. And this uh, assessment facilitates the prediction of consequences and mitigation of risk of AI systems via a multi-stakeholder engagement before a system is released to the public. And allowing those developing a procurement, a procuring AI systems to avoid harmful outcomes, but at least to think about them, to have a, to have a tool by which we can understand what the systems can do and what needs to be enhanced and what needs to be corrected. And the ethical reflection by itself is a vital tool to comprehensively address the questions that everybody has in their minds right now about the risk of AI systems and how we can identify them. And we are currently piloting the uh, ethical impact assessment as well as another tool that we were asked to uh, produce in the recommendation when we this was adopted by our member states, the readiness assessment methodology. This is to see how much countries are well prepared to deal with the, with the legal and regulatory and governance issues related to AI. And we're now working with 50 governments around the world to deploy this uh, tool. The results of this assessment will be made public on the AI Ethics UNESCO Observatory that we are launching with the Alan Turing Institute, but also with the ITU. And this is going to be an online platform to share information and good practices of implementation efforts across the globe, while creating an interactive space for people working on this domain to collaborate and actually to raise awareness, to, be, to, to understand better, to look at what works and what doesn't. And, and then to translate that into actions on the ground to equip ourselves, the governments, the people, civil society, to, to deal with these technologies better. And in this sense, I'm, I'm also glad to share with you that we started a, a, for a, a path-breaking project with the Dutch Digital Infrastructure Authority that is supported by the European Commission DG Reform to enhance the competencies and capacities of the Dutch and European competent authorities to supervise AI and this, uh, above all, considering that uh, the European Commission is going to be implementing soon their AI acts, and they need institutions that are well equipped to deal with the issues. And here again, the large language uh, systems and generative models are more broadly are high on everyone's agenda. And the detailed data, data and analysis from these projects will form the empirical basis for our development of a model governance framework, bringing together the different elements of an ethical AI ecosystem to help guide governments in developing robust governance systems aligned with the recommendation. We will present this framework at the Global Forum on the Ethics of Artificial Intelligence that is going to take place in Slovenia by the, in, the, in the spring of 2024. 
and I'm, I'm looking forward to see you all there uh, to continue learning together and to continue building together the capacities to deal with these technologies. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gabriela, for this marvelous introduction. I think this introduction will help us to fix exactly the scope of our discussion. And as we have seen, there are a lot of challenges raised by the AI generative system. Just a first question, perhaps it would be quite interesting to see among the person present who has already uh, used it, um, AI generative system, like ChatGPT, like uh, I, I did BERT, like uh, RERNI, like uh, Coco, that's a, that's a Korean generative system, who has already used a uh, generative system. Raise your hand. Oh, you see, <laughs> I told everybody has already used it. Uh, you remember in November 22, Sam Alkman, OpenAI CEO, uh, put into the market for the general public certain chat GPT services. Perhaps it, would, it is quite interesting to remember that three years before, uh, Sam Alkman said that chat GPT must be reserved for professional users only because it was too dangerous for a large public. He has modified his mind. It's his business, that's normal. But perhaps it's quite interesting to recall it. This initiative was a full success. One million user, less than five days after the launching. Since this moment, we assist to a multiplication of applications supported by what we call foundation, foundation models, like the Google BART, ChatGPT, definitely, the Baidu Erni, the, the Korean CoGPT, the Meta Open Pretrained Transformer, and another. That's, what is quite interesting is that all these foundation models are general purpose model, and they are not using for a specific purpose. But it is quite clear that apart from this foundation, foundational model, there is a lot of application developed by the, by the same companies or by other companies. And now we are using this, this application. For instance, my students are used to, um, I use it to chat GPT for preparing their hand study memory, definitively. And it is quite clear that if you feel alone, please find with companion chatbots like Replica, Chai, and others, uh, which, understand, uh, which understand you uh, like your best friend or friend in. If as a company you need uh, to develop a marketing strategy, it is very easy to use uh, Jasper as an application for finding the right, uh, the right slogan and definitely the right, uh, the right logo. If you are a work seeker, you want to write, uh, if you want to write a successful letter of motivation, please use a generative AI application. So generative AI systems are more and more used. Uh, I would like to, to give definitively the floor to David in order to answer to a certain number of questions. And my question would be the following. First, uh, generative AI system, I mean both funda foundation models and generative AI application are definitive AI system. Could you please in a few minutes explain the peculiarities of this system among the other AI system and definitely link it with the peculiarities. Is that possible to s explain why this, uh, this generative AI system need a specific attention distinct from that afforded to the other AI system, including for our public authorities? I have another um, question. The application 
of language model, large language models, are diverse, include text compression, text to speech conversion, language translation, chatbots, virtual assistant, speech recognition. They are working with big data. Which ones? Is there a problem with the language used within this big data? And last one, how do you see the future of this generative AI? Is that a revolution? Mr. Be Beckley, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so generative AIs are advanced artificial intelligence systems designed to generate human-like content, including text, images, and uh, even multimedia. Uh, you have probably heard uh, and I'm sure used uh, applications such as ChatGPT uh, that answers to your questions almost as if there is a human being at the other side, at the other end of the line. There are also applications that change photos into artwork, uh, translate people's speech into another language in real time. For example, you have heard probably the news recently, uh, the Secretary General of the UN uh, speaking in a language that he doesn't speak. Uh, so uh, there are so many applications uh, that uh, generative AIs uh, have already shown us. Uh, these models are built on large-scale neural networks, such as GBT, and are trained on vast data sets to learn the patterns and structures of human language and other forms of data. The key peculiarity of the systems lies in their ability to generate coherent and contextually relevant content on their own based on input they receive. Unlike search engines, for example, that we have been using for quite some time now and that provide useful responses, but that are often not in the form that you would expect from a response from a human being. Generative AI responses are very much like what you would expect from another human interlocutor. This has, of course, numerous benefits since the output of generative AI applications can be used almost directly by humans, unlike what you would get from search engines that require human interpretation, filtering, formatting, and often rewriting. But it also brings, as it has been already said by uh, the previous speakers, many challenges that public authorities will have to deal with. One significant aspect that requires specific attention is the potential for biases and ethical concerns with the generated content. Uh, these models learn, as it has been said, from diverse and sometimes biased data sets, reflecting societal prejudices present in the training data. Consequently, the output of these models may inadvertently perpetuate or amplify existing biases, such as race biases, raise concerns about fairness and the reinforcement of harm harmful stereotypes. Already, the use of AI systems in law enforcement raised so much concern that some authorities banned the use of AI, at least for the time being. Another important consideration is the misuse of generative AI for malicious purposes, such as the creation of deep fake content that are indistinguishable from real content. In particular, the technology's ability to mimic human-like communication poses risks to the integrity of information and has implications for issues like misinformation, fake news, and online manipulations. An aspect that I believe should also be a concern is that it renders many societal tools obsolete. For example, as a former teacher myself, I'm concerned by how generative AI affects education. Learning, at least as we understand it today, requires personal work from the learner that needs to be further evaluated by an instructor. Generative AI can now provide an answer to the learner immediately and without effort. And the answer is so much indistinguishable from what a human being would give 
that it is almost impossible for the instructor to know whether the student has given the answer or it is generated by AI. This will have a major and negative impact on the quality of education and create major frictions within schools and universities. Generative AI can also render many jobs obsolete, probably more than any technology in the past. There is almost no industry that has at least a few of its jobs replaced by generative AI. Generative AI can do the work of computer programmers, content creators, legal assistants, teachers, artists, financial advisors, and so forth. This creates this can create a major havoc in societies like we are currently seeing in the movie industry in the US where writers are on strike in most part for fear of losing their jobs to AI. So public authorities need to pay attention to these systems for several reasons. First, there is a need for regulatory framework to address ethical concerns as it has been said by uh, the keynote speaker and mitigate potential misuse of generative AI. Second, public authorities play a crucial role in ensuring transparency and accountability in the development and deployment of these models. And I'm very happy that uh, there are already discussions at UNESCO around this. Third, there is a growing need for public policy that addresses the impact of generative AI on various sectors, including jobs, privacy, intellectual property, and cybersecurity. In general, the peculiarities of generative AI and its massive impact on our societies demand specific attention pro from public authorities to establish ethical guidelines, ensure transparency, and address the broader societal implications of these powerful technologies. I don't think we can stop AI's progress, but I also do not believe that we should let it develop without setting any boundaries. To your other questions on language models, uh, there are many language models like GPT-3 uh, and uh, they are indeed applied across various tasks in different applications such as text completion, text to speech conversion, language translation, etc. These language models, especially large ones like GPT-3, are trained on vast data sets of human language using uh, language use coming from a broad range of texts from internet, books, articles, and various sources. Of course, these sources are not representative of the whole world and they have biases and so on. So there are some concerns. One significant issue as indicated earlier is biases present in the training data. If the training data contains biases or unrepresented samples, the model can inadvertently produce biases outputs reinforcing existing societal prejudices. We raising uh, many uh, ethical questions. There are also concerns about potential misuse of these models for generating deceptive uh, or uh, deceptive or harmful content. We have already seen how social media can create chaos in our societies by spreading misinformation. I come from a country where that has been hardly affected by this misinformation. And I'm very afraid of what can happen with AI. Many people have difficulty to distinguish between the truth and the fake since that they trust what they see in writing. Generative AI is taking the, this problem to a new high with deep fake, where it is possible to make anyone say anything, blurring even more further the line between the truth and the false. This will have an impact on our societies that might be catastrophic if not mitigated well in advance. So for the future of generative AI, despite the many dangers of the generative AI, I believe that there are immense opportunities ahead. I believe that we can expect the development of even more powerful and sophisticated generative models. Moreover, future generative AI models may be fine-tuned to specific industries or domains, allowing for more specialized applications, such as in healthcare, finance, law, and more. I also believe that the researchers and, uh, researchers and public authorities will attempt to address the concerns such as the ethical issues 
And I'm happy to hear that UNESCO has taken this issue uh, uh, very uh, seriously. We have already seen almost unprecedented attention from authorities such as the US Congress, EU Commission, and UNESCO to understand and establish a framework for the development of regenerative AI. UNESCO, for example, has done a number of work and developed a number of recommendations on the ethics of artificial, uh, of, of generative, uh, or of artificial intelligence that has been adopted by all its uh, 193 members that it has been indicated by the keynote speaker. My personal hope is that we learn from the cost of in our inaction on social media and researchers as well as public authorities will act as fast as the development of AI so that the risks are mitigated and the opportunities outweigh the risks. Thank you. Thanks a lot, David. It was very clear. Uh, your presentation was uh, very nice and uh, developed what we have in mind. It means that generative AI systems are multiplying the risk already linked with AI system. And you have developed a certain number of these risks and you have appealed uh, to a public regulation or at least to a regulation. Uh, it is quite clear that generative AI applications are bringing a lot of benefits for all of us, uh, citizens and perhaps societies. But at the same time, as you have said, as you have underlined it, their development are a source of arms, individual arms, as regard definitively financial arms, as regard definitively also physical arms. I, I would like just to, to mention a Belgian case, a recent Belgian SAD case. Uh, in my country, definitely a, a, an engineer, a civil engineer, perhaps a bit depressive, uh, has, decided, has decided after nice and nice discussion with a uh, company on chatbots uh, to commit suicide. And I think it's a risk of manipulation uh, we might fear from AI generative uh, system. And perhaps we have to create a new right, the right to mental integrity. Uh, there are other, definitely there are other risks. There are risk of privacy as regards intellect property. And if we think about human rights, as you, have, uh, as you have noticed it, it is quite clear that we must also speak about the problem of the right to, the, to job. And right to job is, uh, is definitely compromised when you, when you see the problem of the translator, when you see the problem of certain social artists. Uh, definitely, it's not only a question of individual arms, it's also a question of collective arms. And in the second part of our discussion after the, the QA, and the QA time will develop the problem of discrimination, discrimination between countries, between regions, between definitely certain communities. Uh, we will come back on that issue, but you have also mentioned it, and that's very important, the problem for our democracy, and especially as we are the problem of multiplication of um, misinformation and disinformation, especially with the possibility for all people to create deep fakes. How to face all these risks? And uh, I come now uh, to the following speakers. How to face uh, this risk? Uh, it is quite clear that you have um, already mentioned a certain number of initiatives from UNESCO, but it is quite clear that we have also to turn uh, or attention to pay attention to what happens in the, in the two leader countries of AI. I mean uh, China and definitely, and definitely US. And to speak there about, uh, I will ask to Chang Fen Chen uh, from, uh, from Tsinghua University in China and Stefan Verhulst, uh, which is professor at the New York University and their, uh, their director of the governance laboratory 
and editor in chief of data and policy uh, to comment. And on this point, uh, I have a certain number of questions. Uh, perhaps you remember that uh, there was a very important open letter signed by more than 35,000 people, including a very important uh, CEO um, of high tech company like uh, Elon Musk, uh, asking for a moratorium. Um, is that a good solution? Do you think this moratorium is feasible? And they have asked it to stop the development of generative AI system during uh, six months. Do you think it's a, it's a good solution? Um, another problem is definitely uh, the, the question to know to what extent we need a regulatory, a public regulatory answer. And on that point, Chang Fen, uh, it is very interesting to know a bit more about, about the Chinese uh, the Chinese initiative. China was the first uh, to elaborate to elaborate administrative measures, what they call administrative measures, and uh, I would like to know a bit more what uh, what does it mean. Uh, administrative measure as regard generative artificial intelligence services. Uh, they have done that, and uh, definitively, uh, EU has also decided uh, to have a legislation, not administrative measure, but to have a comprehensive legislation about AI, and the, more precisely, with um, the European Parliament, recent European Parliament amendments about generative AI, AI systems. So, uh, I would like to, to see uh, what the, the China's position is. And as regard definitively uh, U.S., uh, they have adopted another, another approach. Uh, U.S. has published it is, uh, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy in October 2022, a blueprint for AI Bill of Rights. Uh, and this blueprint is uh, definitely very interesting, but it is more a sort of co-regulation, discussion and negotiation between public authorities and the big tech, and, uh, the tech sector, definitely, perhaps. And in that blueprint, uh, there are a certain number of recommendations about how to build up, or to build up, uh, AI system and which ethical um, ethical values we uh, we have to follow. So Chang Fen first, and perhaps after you, after that Stefan uh, take the floor on these issues. Chang Fen, you have the floor. Thanks, uh, thanks for Professor Yves Paulet's efforts. Nice to uh, nice to see you all, friends. Uh, it's my honor to attend this session. Uh, before discussing the question, I would like to mention a concept, uh, <laughs> a, a concept uh, about culture lag. Culture lag uh, is a term coined by uh, sociologist uh, William Alban to describe the delayed adjustment of non-material culture to changes in material culture in the 1920s. Uh, it refers to the phenomena where changes in material culture, such as uh, technology uh, tools, occur more rapidly than changes in non-material culture, such as beliefs, values, norms, including uh, regulation. Uh, I think uh, culture lag is describing the situation when generative AI appears. We are excited, and uh, meanwhile, uh, we are panicked. The, cap uh, the capabilities of uh, these new technologies break through the scope of traditional legal re regulations. So f first, I uh, just said uh, we need a regulation for generative AI. Uh, it is a powerful technology with the potential to be used for good or for harm. Uh, but uh, 
generative artificial intelligence is still developing, and uh, even the scientists and the engineers who create it cannot fully explain and predict its future. Therefore, we need to regulate it prudently rather than nip it in the cradle through regulation. So uh, it's uh, the reason because uh, after I introduced some policies and the regulations, I can't uh, uh, judge something. So uh, I just uh, speak these kind of things uh, first. And uh, at the beginning of a new thing, we need to be more inclusive and have the wisdom to calmly deal with the mistakes it causes that only shows human civilization and self-confidence. So uh, the question is uh, uh, a moratorium on generative AI would be a temporary ban on the development and the use of this technology. This would be a drastic uh, measure and it is unlikely to be effective in the long term. Generative AI is a powerful technology with the potential to be used for good, and uh, it would be unwise to stifle its development entirely. Uh, and uh, then, uh, uh, I think uh, a, a global regulatory model for AI, uh, generative AI would be idea, but it will take time to develop and uh, implement. So uh, uh, just talking about uh, in, in China, artificial intelligence, uh, including generative intelligence, is developing very rapidly in China and has been widely used. Generative uh, uh, AI applications from Baidu uh, from um, ByteDance, from iFlyTech, and the other companies are uh, installed on my uh, mobile iPhone, uh, mobile phone, <laughs> and uh, a laptop while uh, using GPT, Bard, and Bing at the same time. When I choose uh, some uh, something in my life, uh, like when I choose restaurant in Beijing or in Shanghai for a party with my friends, uh, these applications always help me. Uh, in the field of education, the uh, artificial intelligence applications developed by iFly Tech are already helping teachers uh, update their curriculum, correct students' homework, and the private, uh, private personalized teaching guidance. So China has been at the forefront of developing and regulating generative AI. In 2022, uh, yeah, 2022 China released the uh, interim administrative measures for generative artificial intelligence services. These measures require providers of generative AI service to uh, source data and uh, foundation models from legitimate sources, respect the intellectual property rights of others, process personal information with appropriate consent or legal basis, establish and uh, implement risk management systems and uh, internal control procedures, take measures to prevent the misuse of generative AI services, such as the creation of harmful content. The interim measures to regulate generative AI services are just a start. China's first uh, artificial intelligence management measures are more re uh, realistic than the previously released draft uh, for comments. On the day the measure was published in the afternoon of July 3rd, uh, July 13, uh, the share price of the ChatGPT concept stock in the Hong Kong stock market rose. 
uh, perhaps, yeah, uh, some legal exper uh, experts believe that the current, uh, the current regulatory framework uh, in China cannot effectively address regulatory challenges. Its main content focuses on regulating providers of AI products of, uh, or services, and it is, uh, still belongs to the traditional responsibility models of AI governance. Uh, generative AI involves divers in titles in uh, multiple circles, such as data owners, computing power suppliers, and uh, model designers. It is unfair for regulations to allocate the uh, heaviest responsibility to providers of generative AI. That's uh, some, uh, the resource of this uh, is from some uh, legal experts who published the article in China in Chinese, and uh, also it is also unable to deal with some social issues. Uh, and I said it's just a start. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Function. That uh, it was a very interesting uh, point you are underlining. Uh, I retained from your intervention first a certain number of key words. Uh, you say uh, the famous cultural lack, I think that's very important. Uh, you call for what you call a prudent regulation, not to go too fast. And definitely you ask for what uh, you, you call uh, an inclusive uh, procedure in order to have the participation of all stakeholders. As regards the content of the administrative measure China uh, has taken, uh, it is quite proximate uh, with what EU regulation is proposing. Uh, uh, I, I've seen that you are quite, uh, uh, um, you pay attention to the intellect property questions, you pay attention to uh, the privacy question. I was very surprised because it's very important in your, uh, in your regulation. And definitely you propose for solving uh, the risk uh, to have internal risk assessment, risk assessment uh, which must definitely identify the risk, not only individual risk, but also societal risk, and definitively, which uh, is proposing a certain number of mitigation of this risk. So I, I am quite comfortable with this, uh, this approach because uh, she, this approach is quite uh, proximate uh, of the EU regulation. Uh, and now I turn uh, to Stefan and I give the floor to Stefan because you have at US taken another option and it is perhaps quite interesting to see to what extent even if US has taken a, a co-regulation approach uh, the same principle, some ethical principle might be developed and the same procedure uh, might be implemented. Stefan you have the floor. Yeah, thanks so much, and uh, I hope you can hear me. Thanks, uh, Eve, for um, having me, and I wish uh, I was there in person myself uh, in this beautiful room we have there, which looks like uh, a really um, um, adequate place for having a conversation like this. And so just to um, 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 cover the questions you posed, the first question seems to me was really about the moratorium. And I think uh, the discussion, from my point of view, did open up a broader debate uh, whether a, a moratorium is even feasible or whether we should really focus on a responsible technology development uh, as opposed to banning or even having government uh, intervene in how innovation is being facilitated. And I think it was an interesting conversation, but at the same time, I think in addition to this tension between a moratorium and a responsible um, uh, development uh, approach, the underlying tension was also to what extent 
should the development of AI, and in particular case here, the development of large language models and generative AI be open or closed? Because that was the other big discussion from my point of view, which from my point of view was actually more interesting uh, because it really um, um, identified the uh, interests behind the moratorium and also the interests that are currently uh, being proposed. Because on the one hand, you have organizations like surprisingly OpenAI advocating for closed development, uh, quite often uh, with the argument that if you would open up the development of uh, large language models or generative AI, uh, you would have the potential for abuse. But then on the other hand, you have Meta, for instance, which has been advocating for an open approach uh, uh, to the development of generative AI, which from my point of view um, is actually most um, uh, in sync with how AI has been developed till recently. Most of the uh, research as it relates to artificial intelligence was always open. And as a result, I would argue, has actually been able to make massive uh, advances because it was open and because you had a whole army of entry developers, researchers working on improving existing models, including GPT models. If we start closing it, then on the one hand, we actually will create new power asymmetries between those that actually have the closed models versus those that have the open models. But from my point of view, it would actually be an undermining uh, a core principle of research in the artificial intelligence space, which always has been open. And by making it open, you will also be uh, far better in a position to actually identify the weaknesses, the challenges that might be, might be out there. And I think that is another EVE uh, layer that I think uh, needs to be addressed, uh, which is not just about regulate or not regulate. It's really about to what extent should you make the technology open so that you actually can really examine what are the vulnerabilities. And of course, the argument here is that if you make it open, others will use it, but that does not, from my point of view, um, um, validate uh, a closed approach because a closed approach, from my point of view, will actually um, solidify the current uh, power asymmetries that you have in the market that uh, actually, from my point of view, are equally challenging and important to be addressed than just a potential abuse of the technology itself. So that's as it relates to the first uh, question, uh, Eve, which is anyway a more kind of sophisticated, we need a more sophisticated way to have a conversation about a moratorium. It's really about how do we actually develop um, technology in a responsible way. I don't think a ban will automatically make it responsible and actually will solidify certain kinds of power positions. And then the second element is really to what extent can we sustain the kind of uh, culture of openness as it relates to uh, artificial intelligence research that has uh, made tremendous strides uh, till date. Now, of course, you asked uh, what's the approach from uh, the US as it relates to AI and then specifically as it relates to generative AI. And as always, um, uh, it's more complicated than just one approach. And I think there are multiple approaches currently being tested out. And from my point of view, I would just touch on kind of six um, approaches that we can see within a US context. And indeed, indeed, if as you rightly said, many of the approaches might be somewhat or feel like they are different, but many of the principles that underpin those approaches are actually very much in sync with, for instance, the UNESCO recommendations and also very much in sync with emerging other principles, such as the ones that have been advocated within Europe as a result of the uh, AI Act as well. And also, before I delve deeper in, it also suffice, um, and it is perhaps important to uh, state that the US is again a member of UNESCO and that that also provides a new opportunity to actually bring the US within the uh, conversations as it relates to the implementation of the UNESCO recommendations, which, uh, as you know, was um, the US was absent uh, till recently. And I think uh, having the US again being a member provides an opportunity to also perhaps uh, create uh, more, uh, more um, approaches that are in sync 
uh, also at the international level as well. Now, the six approaches, the one uh, approach that already was mentioned uh, by Eve is more kind of a rights-based based approach, right? And indeed, uh, OSDP uh, has tried to convene kind of a multi-stakeholder approach in order to develop this kind of bill of rights, which was really an effort to set out a set of principles, a set of rights that need to be enshrined in a voluntary way. Because indeed, Eve, as you rightly said, this is not about kind of hard regulation. This is more kind of co-design of some kinds of frameworks that uh, subsequently will need to be implemented in some kind of a self-regulatory, voluntary kind of way. But the uh, Bill of Rights was interesting because it did specify a set of um, principles and a set of areas of concern, such as, for instance, the need to really focus on safety and effectiveness of the systems that are being prov provided, focusing on algorithmic discrimination, focusing on privacy. And of course, as you know, the US does not have a national uh, privacy uh, legislation, but I think the Bill of Rights was important to emphasize the need for perhaps a more national uh, a cross sectoral approach as it relates to privacy in order to deal with also um, um, uh, AI, but also issues of notice and explainability, which again is not unique to the US, but has, uh, is uh, coming up everywhere. And then, of course, also the need to think about human alternatives as opposed to automated alternatives in actually making decisions. And so these were kind of the areas that the Bill of Rights. Um, uh, addressed and subsequently also provided the framework for additional commitments because I think that's the second uh, big element that uh, what has happened within the US is that the White House through for instance the Bill of Rights but also uh, through other means have, um, in, have been able to um, engage uh, all the large tech companies in making commitments for um, um, uh, responsible development of AI, which includes uh, commitments to test uh, their systems uh, to, to what extent they are aligned with a, um, uh, an assessment tool that interestingly was developed uh, in a collective manner during DEF CON uh, 31, which in itself was kind of an interesting exercise because here, where they try to tap into the collective intelligence of expertise in order to come up with actually a framework that then subsequently was uh, recommended by uh, the White House to be uh, um, the framework to assess. If you want yeah, to just, a, just a, a remark, perhaps it, it would be needed to conclude in, a, in one or two minutes because we yes. have a lot of uh, sure. other well, discussion. Let me, yeah. I know, I know. So yeah, and I can go on the wall here. Uh, the other element, and I will briefly uh, 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 emphasize some, uh, some aspects, the other element is, of course, that we also have seen the creation of methodologies to assess risk, similar to what has happened in Europe. I think NIST, uh, or the National Institute of Standards and Technology, developed its uh, risk uh, assessment framework, where it really tries to define what is trustworthiness and how do we know what a system systems are trustworthy. And I think it's definitely a worthwhile uh, exercise to uh, look into it. And then uh, the other element, which is always important, is not only regulation, but quite often the shadow of regulation, given the fact that we are relying on self-regulation. And so what has happened is that uh, Senator Schumer, uh, who uh, leads the, um, the Senate, uh, ultimately has held a set of hearings. And as you know, hearings is actually a very valuable uh, tool in actually regulation because it does uh, provide for oversight and it does provide for a, a discussion. Last thing I will say, uh, Eve, and then I will shut up, is that while all this has happened and while a lot of this is actually core regulation, in most cases, self-regulation, uh, what we have seen happening is that the states in the US uh, have actually become far more active than the federal uh, agencies in regulating, which refers again, uh, Eve, to my uh, other area of interest in AI governance, which is, of course, AI localism. And what we have seen is that states and cities have actually been really active 
in AI governance in the US. There were about 200 bills at the moment uh, being uh, proposed at the state level and multiple cities have started legislating AI as well. And I think that's also worth noting uh, at the international level that states and cities are actually in the forefront of uh, coming up with uh, frameworks and legislation. And I'm going to stop here. <laughs> Definitely, thanks. Uh, thanks, thanks, uh, Stefan. Um, I think your proposal to complexify the discussion, notably as we got uh, the, the question of the open AI, is definitely a very interesting thing. And I think we, uh, we have to come back during the, the question and also uh, uh, time. Uh, an, another question, nice. Uh, uh, I, I think is that you said that you have repeated uh, the same ethical values than the ethical values asserted by China. And I think we have a sort of common agreement about the fact that ethical values are fixed by the UNESCO uh, in, a very, in a very clear way and that we might accept that. So I, I don't think there is really a problem of as we ethical values. The, the problem is more how to enforce these ethical, uh, these ethical values. And you have proposed uh, to pay attention not only to public or self-regulation, but uh, you mentioned a certain number of things like standardization, like definitively like quality, uh, assessment, and I think that's very, very interesting. And uh, you finish by this marvelous um, point about AI localism regulation, and uh, I think that's very powerful. I think we we need also the fact that uh, communities, local communities, are taking uh, that very seriously, and that they are proposing uh, solutions which are. Uh, totally in accordance with their culture and uh, with uh, the habits of the of this uh, of these people okay so now we have a question and answer uh, discussion uh, i know that uh, fabio uh, thanks a lot for being the moderator as always as already uh, certain questions please thank you so we have two uh, questions or in comments online, uh, more or less connected. One of them is from Omar Farouk, a 17 years old, years old boy from B Bangladesh, uh, who sent some very nice contributions. I won't read uh, all the contributions because we will use in the, the, in the, the chat. chat, but just mm -hmm. to mention uh, one, uh, regarding the question two, uh, the, the comment from Omar is, convene a global forum on generative AI to discuss the ethical, legal, and social implication of these technologies, support research on the impact of generative AI on everyone, including ch children and young people, and promote digital literacy and critical thinking skills among children and young people so that they can be informed users of generative AI. And also, Steven uh, Voslo, uh, building on Omar's point, uh, Stephen from UNICEF uh, are, say that they are all also concerned that, that there's no uh, non, uh, they don't know yet the impacts of generative AI, positive and, and negative, on children's and social, emotional, and cognitive development. Research is critical, but take time. So, how is the best way to navigate the reality that the tools uh, are out in the public, and we need to protect and empower children today? Uh, but when, but we will only fully know uh, the impacts later. So how, how to deal with the, the need for research, but at the same time, uh, the things are out there. Thanks a lot for this first question. Perhaps uh, I ask to the different speakers, and not only the, the speakers who have already uh, taken the floor, but also to Siva and, and perhaps you, Fabio, uh, if they want to answer to these questions. And definitely, I s have a look at the audience. Uh, you, I see the micro are there, so perhaps if you have other questions, perhaps it would be interesting uh, to raise now. These questions. 
No, there is nobody. Okay. Um, to, I, I come to the two first questions, and, and it's quite interesting to see that there are questions raised by young people. And, uh, quite very, very interesting, and uh, there is a, a specific need uh, for being educated in the, the use of this, uh, uh, of this generative AI system. It is quite interesting. Uh, I think that uh, I think I had in, in mind. Uh, Stefan has, has spoken about uh, the fact that you, uh, you, you must have responsible people using uh, AI generative system. And when you think about responsible people, it is not only the, the tech companies we are, which are developing uh, this AI system, but also the users. So perhaps it might be quite interesting in that line to, uh, to answer to, to the questions. But are there answer, function, Stefan, Siva, Fabio, no? Yeah, happy to, meaning yeah, yeah. happy to, uh, to briefly reflect on that. And I fully agree with uh, uh, Omar is that we do need to engage with uh, young people in a far more sophisticated way to really figure out, A, what are their preferences, B, what are their solutions? Because I think it's not just about uh, listening to uh, young people. They actually might have solutions that uh, uh, are far more uh, informed because of their um, uh, being dig digital natives uh, in many countries as well. And so we, we just finished actually last week, we had six huge solutions labs uh, in six uh, regions together with UNICEF and with the uh, Lancet Commission focusing on adolescent well-being. And one of the questions that we posed to them was actually about data and artificial intelligence. And the responses were extremely sophisticated and it shows that young people really have a sense on what is happening and how what their uh, preferences are as it relates to AI as well. And so we need a, a lot more of those conversations, especially in countries like in low and middle income countries where the majority uh, are actually young people. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to actually engage the majority in order to really become more legitimate on how to go about AI as well. So I fully uh, embrace that. Uh, and, uh, and I think we actually also need to do a lot more innovation in how we engage with youth, uh, which is why perhaps, anyway, good that Omar joined today, but not many youth are, uh, are joining <laughs> uh, sessions like, uh, like the ones that we have, which is still kind of uh, based upon, anyway, how we've done uh, uh, conversations for the last 50 years. And I think they have moved on and are com having, having conversations in different platforms where we, as and, and I talk about myself, uh, kind of the aging population are not uh, uh, used to uh, have those conversations. So we need to really innovate in that way as well. Thanks, Stefan. I, I think function is uh, anything to say, to, something to say. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, uh, generative mm -hmm. artificial intelligence is conducted, uh, conducive to educate um, young people. And uh, it creates a view of rights. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a theory of uh, uh, rights for uh, children uh, in the media literacy. That young people have the right to use new technologies to learn and uh, to develop themselves. And adults and the professionals should uh, have the obligation to guide uh, the young people. And uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, a long process uh, to young people to get this, uh, this right. But I think uh, uh, the efforts uh, has begun, uh, has start. Uh, UNESCO uh, has a media and information literacy week uh, in this uh, end of the month. Uh, in, in, yeah, the, in the last week of this month, uh, in Judan, Judan, what is it? Judan, yes. Uh, many people is worried about the uh, young people who uh, are in this kind of situation, and uh, uh, I, uh, I think uh, we should uh, give young people the right.
and uh, also uh, for the technology company, they should uh, create some special uh, help for the young people. Thanks a lot. I'm quite interested by this new right uh, for uh, children to use technology for their own uh, development. That's a very interesting uh, point. Uh, yeah? yeah but okay, I, I think we have a question from a remote audience. Doa, you have a question? Please, two minutes, no more, because we have other things to develop. Do I, you have thank the floor. Uh, thank you. I hope you can hear me. No, uh, I'm Doa. I'm a program specialist at UNESCO working with Gabriel. I actually wanted to react to the previous questions, if, if that's okay, uh, very quickly and briefly. I think the questions are very important and pressing because it's it's true, as very rightly pointed out, that even you know, if we would think about yeah, a new... A new ethical framework or a new regulation for um, for generative AI in particular, it would take a lot of time, and it would be indeed more wise to utilize the tools that we currently have, like like the recommendation and other um, guidelines on AI to be used. But but until you know we have more concrete takes so what can be done in practice i think it's important to also go back to the essentials of awareness uh, raising most people that i know are, are uh, and especially i think young people it's very tempting to use those models right because it, it shortens a lot our time our uh, our efforts but not too many are actually uh, aware of the risks that are rightly pointed up by all the panelists. Usually, only if people would try to use um, generative models, you know, to ask questions that you already kind of know the answer in advance, you would see the pitfalls, you would okay. see the, the challenges, um, the inaccuracy, the references to sources that, that are made up and, and things like that. Um, so I think being aware, uh, raising sorry, the, awareness. The, the, I, I think we have understood what you mean. Thanks a lot for your intervention, but we, I must restrict yeah. you. I'm sorry. Okay. No Thanks. worries. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Uh, there is a question in the room. There are two questions on the. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, as a child rights uh, researcher from Germany, I appreciate really that we have uh, questions about um, the rights and the interests of young persons in this room. But for me, it's not just a question of the responsible usage of young people, persons um, of AI. It's a question of the responsible usage of, its, of us all. And much more important for me is that it's not uh, that it's also a question of a responsible coding and designing and I'm wondering if this could be um, evaluate in a process of self-regulation or if it it's not necessary to have a kind of uh, official institution um, to give a permission if such an AI technology uh, should be um, Come, come into force or are distributed uh, to us all. So maybe I'm not familiar with uh, the proposed uh, bills and laws, um, but maybe we can hear something about that. Is it the right way to self-regulate it um, by the private sector, these uh, responsible um, uh, technologies, or do we have an um, maybe um, official um, institution to give a kind of certificate or permission to, yeah, to roll it out. Thanks. Thanks a lot for your question. It is quite clear that we have already a certain labeling institution and your question uh, might, re might refer uh, to the use of uh, the standardization process as a solution uh, for um, a responsible AI 
which must follow uh, the, the standards. The problem is that there is not a lot as regards the AI generative system of standards and uh, the, the company must work on that issue very actively. Okay, there is another question, I think. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Tapani Tatvanen from Electronic Frontier Finland. And it seems to me that we are already talking about the past. The AI systems are no longer the purview of big tech companies only. When you can run a large language model on your own laptop, and the cat, or let's say the llama, is already out of the bag in that respect. Basically, everybody is not only AI actor in the sense that the, of the UNESCO document, but effectively will be developer as well. When, and I predict this will happen in about two years, it will be easy to develop your own AI models without serious technical expertise. Everybody can be doing that. And you cannot regulate everybody. You can't, okay, it would be, would be nice if all developers would be responsible as it were, but if everybody's a developer, I can't see how you can make everybody responsible. Maybe someone can, I'd be happy about that. Okay. But I don't see how that works. So think about the implications of people, all people, criminals, young people, anybody, developing AI models okay. for themselves to do whatever they want them to do, not just using the existing things developed by someone we can regulate. So what can be regulated is the question. You can regulate commercial usage, official mm -hmm. usage, the data perhaps mm -hmm. that can be used, but the development, no, I don't think you can. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your statement. Uh, I am afraid we have to go to, to the second part of, uh, of our session and to give the floor uh, to uh, Fabio and, uh, and Siva. Siva uh, is present remotely. And I have two questions. A recent OECD report or large language model has clearly demonstrated in the poor performance of these tools in many languages other than predominant language in the AI system like English or Chinese. Notwithstanding and that notwithstanding the effort of certain states to establish big data in their own language. I, I mean, for instance, uh, the, the Finland has uh, taken a certain number of measures to develop a data repository in, in Finnish language. More important is the fact that the generative AI systems are promoting cultural inference. How do you see the solution to that discrimination denunciated by the UNESCO recommendation? A second uh, question is also the fact that the use of most of the generative AI application, contrary uh, to the traditional internet service, are based on a business model which requires payment for the proposed service. Once again, there is a risk to see a certain number of persons excluded from the benefits of this innovation according to an inclusive scenario. Or do you see the, that risk and which solution are you envisaging to solve it? Siva, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the opportunity. Uh, I have uh, benefited from listening to the previous panelists' presentations and all of the questions. Uh, basically, when uh, you see, because UNESCO document really is aware of the kind of issues that we are discussing, but at the same time, uh, they are more of a generalistic kind of solutions that offers. And uh, we all know how the technology... Siva, is that possible to increase the volume? It seems that they... Yes. I'm audible now. Is that okay for you? Please. Go for it. Is it okay? Yeah, uh, I audible? think. Is it okay? It's okay for me. Okay, okay. So what uh, uh, is important for us is generally any technology, technology discriminates between those who are better off and those who are not better off those who are uh, in terms of uh, education, in terms of resources and other things who control or who do not control. This is one thing that we must remember. 
that's where discrimination begins and in the that is the big discrimination lies in that source itself and uh, that's in fact what artificial intelligence has done is it has created new kinds of inequalities new kinds of divides that's what we call digital divide or in fact the digital divides are co actually uh, they coexist or they accelerate the existing socio cultural and other kind of inequalities and that, that that's where when we are talking about uh, the technologies technologies by themselves are creation of the uh, you know companies or individuals or anybody else but then they have their motives they have their kinds of uh, a kind of ideas and that doesn't really affect uh, they are, they are not we they are, may not be they may not be very much concerned about the other uh, inclusivity and other kinds of problems because it's a profit is more important for them and uh, this this in fact has been established very widely by scholars and uh, in fact what uh, we find is uh, the artificial intelligence has affected the societies in multiple ways and it has also affected the societal relations in fact it has affected the socio cultural ecosystems whether it is through uh, uh, you know uh, using fake news or uh, uh, other kinds of uh, uh, kinds of things or breaching the privacy or in you have number of things that are discussed already and given this uh, we must also remember that because these uh, generative models are also a challenge for ethical issues in fact uh, we need to focus on ethical and well being issues of artificial intelligence and uh, including generative ai specifically uh, reflecting on the marginal communities or the indigenous communities or those who are poor and illiterate especially more from the uh, you know uh, global south and uh, in fact this is where uh, most of these generative models are general in, in a sense in fact uh, uh, stefan was talking about the kind of layers you some of them are larger in terms of their applications they are more in, more in terms of uh, uh, homogeneous in the kind of forms but when we are talking about societies they are when they are plural societies multicultural societies multilingual societies the problems are compounded and even within that the gender and other issues also become more problematic so which means that when we are talking about any kind of guidelines any kind of restrictions or any kind of uh, controls they one has to be sensitive to all these kinds of layers of hierarchies and uh, in fact what we find is the generative models have in fact dispensed with to a larger extent many sections of people you don't need uh, the writer somebody can uh, you know uh, uh, replace them and we also have uh, the kind of issues uh, especially i uh, let me not waste much of the time because of the capacity of the time i will just touch upon uh, that uh, uh, the what the uh, ai as well as generative models are doing is they are creating a kind of a uh, disconnect between uh, the humans and within the societies and also between humans and nature so what we need to do is basically uh, we must focus on uh, more the local or regional specific approaches in generation we must also try to uh, uh, you know use the or develop a database from the local knowledges traditional epistemologies which are more usable for building better knowledge societies and for also finding solutions to the human problems that we have this can be really a good contribution to humanity and also the nature uh, in, in in order to build a sustainable and equal societies and that is what i would like to briefly touch upon i can answer elaborate 
you have question over because uh, the time is uh, very short. Thank you. Thanks, Siva. Thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, I like your expression, when Bill of Rights for every citizen, everybody in the world, but plural society, and you come back to the idea developed by Stefan about localism. And I think it's very, very important to, to hear that from you. Uh, Fabio, you have the floor. Thank you, Yves. Uh, uh, but just a question. Is that possible to, to have 15 minutes f more? Uh, I'm turning to the technicians. Is that possible to have 15 minutes more now? No. I think we will do escalator. Is that okay? Okay. 10 minutes is okay. okay. Thank you. No, I'll, I'll, try, I'll try to be very brief, and, and it's very easy to speak that after such a great contributions for that we have. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just highlight a few points from my perspective. I'm, I, I work in, in Brazil in, in CETIC.br, which is UNESCO Category 2 Center, and is also connected to the Brazilian multi-stakeholder internet governance model represented by NIC.br and CGI.br. And as producing research and data in the field, uh, we, we need to say that we don't know yet and we don't have enough data on this issue, so th this, there is a need for, for, for more investigations in, in, in this area. But we do know some things that I think it's important to understanding the possible risks and the possible inf influence of the scenario. First, of course, uh, the, the global digital inequality, so in the, such as the inequalities among countries and regions and how they access the internet and the digital technologies, how, how this can impact the quality of the training data that, that these models have, so, uh, such as issues like languages, so why, uh, how such uh, part of the languages are not represented or well represented in, the, in, this, in these models, but also the inequalities within countries that also affects much uh, the, the diversity of the data used. So uh, in the case of Brazil, we know that there are persistent patterns of inequalities, digital inequalities connected to race and uh, gender, rural versus urban population, income, level of education, age, and, and so on. So uh, from, from the perspective of the, the diversity and e inclusiveness uh, of the process, I think uh, digital inequalities is something very important. But also from the perspective of the use of the, these tools, or this type of uh, generative uh, AI tools. So these also can be affected by uh, or, or correlated with other aspects such as poverty and other vulner vulnerabilities. So we know for, from other te technologies and disruptive uh, technologies that early adopters tend to benefit more when a new application is available and, and, and the impacts tend to be more disrupted in the early phases of dissemination of those tools when a few can, can access and benefit from it. So from a, a perspective of fairness and non-discrimination, I think this is also important. And, and finally, I think also when we talk about digital inequalities, we also, we, we are not talking about just access and use, but also about skills. So what are the, the real, the differences between the abilities that individuals have in, ter in terms of using this. So we know uh, from the data we have in Brazil, we know that, for instance, uh, w when we research uh, children use of the internet and, and their skills, we know that although operational and social skills uh, are very widespread uh, among this, this population, informational skills, who, the skills that are related to cr the critical understanding of content, for instance, is underdeveloping among uh, the population that we interviewed in the case of Brazil. For instance, 43% uh, of children uh, 11 to 17 years old in the country agree that the first result from a, a survey online is the best result. 51% agree that every person finds the same content when searching online. And 42% are unsure about their ability to check online information. So we are talking about, uh, in, in this case, about children. Uh, and, and the need for raising awareness and literacy and AI literacy in, in throughout the educational systems in also, is also an issue. So just to finish, uh, I would like to call the attention for, of course, the need for data production and for research and, and to understand better the, the, this process. But from the data we have, we already know that 
we need to face uh, digital inequality as a matter of having an AI that is more inclusive and human-centered. So this is my perspective for now, and, and thank you. Thanks a lot to Fabio for uh, this very short, but definitely very interesting uh, remarks. I think you have given very concrete indicators about uh, what happens and the inequalities uh, we are facing there's a new technology. So we might go now to the question and answer time. I don't know if uh, there are questions. And after that, we will have a tour de table among the person, the panelists, in order to have from them in one minute a recommendation to address to the IGF about generative AI system. So, Please, as we the, the question and answer online, there is no questions. Perhaps Mr. Barbosa, no? No? Okay. So I turn my hat, no? Okay, so we, we might go directly uh, to the recommendation, and perhaps I, I will start with Siva. Uh, you have finished with a very strong recommendation, so perhaps you, you might repeat it. And so uh, Noemi might write what you, have, what you had exactly in mind. Siva, you have the floor yeah. for one minute. <laughs> yeah, yes. My, my uh, uh, recommendation would be that when we are designing uh, the AI uh, um, generative models, we should concentrate more on the local and regional kind of issues so that we can think in terms of multicultural aspects and also inclusivity. Only then they will be able to participate. Otherwise, we'll be excluding all sections of them, which are majority. They don't form minority. Thank you. Thanks a lot for this recommendation. Uh, we are not presently in that uh, sort of situation because it is quite clear that uh, uh, if you want to create big data, you need a lot of data. You need uh, definitely a very complex uh, algorithmic system. Uh, you know that yeah. uh, most of uh, the large language models are using more than one billion of parameters. So how to develop all that? That's uh, yeah. very, very difficult. Uh, can, can, I yeah. little, can I add a little? Can I add a little? Yeah. yeah. I, you see, that's where I was suggesting that the local knowledge systems uh, need to be uh, documented so that that can help in building this kind of models. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, Siva, for this precision. Uh, Function, have you a recommendation? Yes, the discussion and question were very interesting and inspired me to bring up a, a related thinking professionalism. I think a kind of a professionalism in uh, artificial intelligence should be uh, promoted. Professionalism is a set of standards and the behaviors that individuals and organizations are expected to adhere to in the workplace. Uh, it involves demonstrating certain qualities and characteristics that uh, contribute to the uh, positive and effective work environment, just uh, as the justice to law and the uh, fact to journalism. Um, key aspects of professionalism include uh, reliability, high standards, ethical behavior, respect, responsibility, uh, teamwork, and so on. So uh, for artificial intelligence, human need to have a real professional concerns okay. on the question. new technology mm -hmm. rather than regionalize, regionalize the values and the regulations. Uh, of course, we still need to respect the uh, uh, multicultural values, but uh, at the same time, in the general technical field, we need to have a general thinking. So I think AI journalism can, uh, AI professionalism can have uh, the effect of uh, the regulation. Thanks, Long Function. Uh, Mr. Beckley, have you certain ideas regarding recommendation? 
thank you. Uh, I agree with most of the things that have been said, and in particular on uh, the importance of uh, uh, having local responses uh, to the question. Uh, I believe that uh, generative AI shouldn't be imposed on any society. Societies have to choose uh, how they use it. Uh, but I see some challenges, uh, particularly uh, resources. Uh, some countries don't have the resources uh, uh, to deal with these kind of problems, uh, and also, uh, you know, the knowledge. So I think it's uh, important for uh, organizations such as UNESCO uh, to make sure that uh, everyone is empowered, everyone understands the issues, uh, and uh, has the possibility, uh, you know, uh, to address the issues at a local level. Uh, and also, I think uh, the big companies also have the responsibility uh, to support, uh, even financially, uh, poorer countries so that they decide what they take from this uh, important revolution. Thank you. Thanks a lot, David. And Stefan, perhaps, no? Yeah, sure. And um, so very shortly, I think um, uh, we need to pay more attention to the um, uh, fundamental um, principle of garbage in, garbage out, as it relates to generative AI, which means that we actually have to focus on not just anyway, the model, but really on thinking about how do we actually create quality data and, and be more focused on the data side, and then being focused on unlocking quality data, which means that the whole agenda of open data, open science, and quality statistics has actually got more has become more important than ever uh, because if we want to have quality of generative AI, we actually need to have the infrastructure. Thanks. Fabio, you are the last one. Thank you. No, just to highlight the, also the need for uh, monitoring and evaluation. I think we have to, to foster both international frameworks. There is the Rome X indicators from UNESCO. There is the OECD Observatory on AI. I think those tools can be very useful for nationally and internationally, create ways of, of fostering research, monitoring, and, and understanding the impacts of those, those tools that are already emerging. Thanks, Fabio. I, I think it was a marvelous transition to you, Marielsa. Marielsa, thanks a lot for joining us. I know that it is very, very, very early in the morning, uh, and definitely uh, thanks a lot for being with us. Mayaza, you, you are the director of the IFAP program, so perhaps a few words. Uh, you have heard uh, the expectation uh, of a certain number of persons uh, from UNESCO, so perhaps you have the, the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Eve. Um, and, and hello, everyone. I'm really pleased that I can join you, even if it's for only part of this very important Internet Governance Forum session on generative AI. Uh, unfortunately, I had a, a previous commitment. Uh, but in my capacity as the secretary of the UNESCO Information for All program, let me first warmly congratulate Eves and the IFAP Working Group on Information Ethics, uh, which is the convener of this fascinating discussion on generative AI. And this is a new technology which holds profound implications for our societies. It's crucial that we examine the impacts that it has through the lens of both ethics and human rights. IFAP is an intergovernmental program that supports member states in fostering inclusive knowledge societies. And our mission is fostering universal access to information and knowledge for sustainable development. Information ethics is, of course, among our top priorities. And IFAP has recently endorsed a new strategic plan for the period for 2023-2029 that emphasizes the implications of digital technologies, including AI, to our right to access to information. And one of the areas of work that we have is to build capacities for and convene reflections on ethical, legal, and human rights issues that arise out of frontier technologies. And this session, this marvelous session, is an example of the excellent contributions being made by the IFAP Working Group dedicated to this topic. 
And the application of frontier digital technologies that go from artificial intelligence, including generative AI, blockchain, internet of things, artificial reality and neurotechnology, are profound over information ecosystems. And we need to really grapple with these implications. And so what IFAP does is support and encourage a series of actions. For example, we work on promoting research into these implications to the inclusive, equitable and knowledge societies, um, raising awareness of the sustainable development opportunities that these technologies bring, but also the, you know, of the risks and the mechanisms to address these risks, uh, including the impact, for example, on privacy, on the environment, and, and so on and so forth. Um, following the endorsement of UNESCO's 41st uh, General Conference uh, uh, on the recommendation of the ethics of artificial intelligence, which is the first global instrument uh, on artificial intelligence, um, IFAP promotes the implementation of the recommendation and supports regional and international cooperation, research, exchange of good practices, and development of uh, understanding and capabilities to respond to these ethical, uh, ethical impacts. Uh, over information ecosystems. IFAP also promotes applying evidence-based frameworks and a mode stakeholder approach towards designing and governing artificial intelligence. And we certainly use uh, the principles of the internet universality realm that Fabio just mentioned, which says that digital systems must be human rights-based, open, accessible, and mode stakeholder governed. IFAP also serves as a platform for member states, academia, civil society, private sector, to share experiences and best practices that overcome digital divides and inequalities, including these different uh, uh, capacities to work with uh, technologies such as generative AI. We assist institutions in ensuring that AI technologies are accessible and beneficial to everyone, including marginalized communities and groups such as women, the elderly, persons with disabilities, and so on. And we participate in global dialogues and forums across the globe on the trigger discussions among all stakeholders to share the challenges, the best practices, and the lessons learned uh, on, on, the, on this uh, technology. And, and this is why I'm calling upon all stakeholders that are here today um, to amplify the call for human-centric approaches to AI. Um, not only it's a common collective effort that we need to shape a digital future that upholds shared values and builds sustainability and equality across uh, 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 all knowledge societies. And for that, um, I want to congratulate again the working group on, on uh, information ethics and particularly Eve, which has been taking this critical conversation forward through a series of major global and regional workshops on this topic. And I hope that you can all join the, their next events and disseminate the outcomes of this discussion. So thank you very much for your insights and commitment to shaping a really more informed and ethical digital future that leaves no one behind. Back to you, Yves. Thank you. Thanks, Maria, for these marvelous uh, concluding remarks. That's uh, um, a pity we have to finish this uh, Workshop so early, I think we need more than one day uh, for discussing all the all the topics we have mentioned today. But definitely, it will be a common collective effort uh, to uh, address all these issues and to find solution to all these issues. So I I would like first to to thank the technicians uh, for their nice support. I think that's very important, and uh, thanks a lot. Uh, and for their comprehensiveness as regards uh, the fact that we have 10 minutes more. I would like to, to thank the audience, the remote audience, and definitely uh, the person who had the courage to stay here. And definitely I would like to thank very, very, very strongly uh, the panelists for their uh, nice input uh, to the discussion. Uh, I see, Marielva, that you... Raise your hand? No. Yeah, okay. Oh, no, so, no, that was an okay. applause. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, we, we, I, I think we need applause, definitely.